The year is 1701, and well, a lot has happened in the world of beer, and this century is really going to shake things up. So I'm going to slow it down with each episode now, because things are about to speed up the closer and closer we get to the Industrial Revolution. Let's recap quickly. So, the first beers were a sort of porridgey soup that was a drink and a meal combined. Over the centuries, we founded civilizations and refined this process, making what would eventually become ale in the medieval period. Beer brewing was generally a domestic affair, and at first they weren't made with hops, but with a groot, a mixture of herbs and spices and such. The first sort of industrialization of beer came along with the monasteries, who would brew beer, make wine, and sell these groots for beer making. Outside of the holy sites, people were capitalising on making more beer than usual and selling some of that good stuff to create a business from their home, inviting the community to their houses, which were now open to the public. Roadside services and places in the cities and towns were also selling beer to thirsty travellers as well. Eventually, we discovered hops, and this created a split. The hoppy stuff we were calling beer, and the non-hoppy stuff we were calling ale. England resisted the hoppier beers, while European brewers embraced them. The 1500s brought with them the invention of lager, and the beginnings of a shift from domestic production to commercial, with another shift happening from brewing being done by women on small scales to being brewed on larger scales by men. The 1600s brought with them the beer bottle near its beginning, and towards the end of them, the official measure of the English pint. However, beer was starting to get expensive, thanks to various wars and thanks to taxes on certain imports, and gin and other spirits were becoming increasingly popular, which brings us neatly up to the first part of the 1700s. Before we dive in though, do feel free to grab yourself a drink, like, subscribe and all that good stuff. Let's start off in 1701, where a chap called Jethro Tull, no, not that one, invented a horse-drawn seed drill, which were the beginnings of modern agriculture, which would open the doors for the vast fields of barley needed for the sheer amounts of beer that get produced today. Robert Walpole also rocks up to England's Parliament this year, and he's an interesting dude, and there's a link to Ancient Accounts video on him in the description. 1702 brought the first attempt at a modern factory, and the world's first English-language newspaper, the Daily Courant, and a new queen, Queen Anne. 1703 brought forth the birth of Charles Wesley, who would become a big deal in Christianity later on. 1704 brought us Isaac Newton's optics, where he tried to figure out how light worked, and this was the beginning of the thoroughbred horses that are used in today's horse racing, which is important because of the uneasy history of gambling in pubs. In 1705, a chap called Edmund Haley predicted that the weird streaky thing in the sky would return in 1757. 1706 would be a really big year, as the UK and Scotland became a united kingdom, and Twining's Tea Shop would open its doors, and it is still open today in 2022. That's right, a tea shop is older than the United States. Now around this time, although it is a bit fuzzy, the first porters emerged from the brewers of the UK. This dark, roasty beer got its name from the people that drank most of it, the porters of London, who would take a break from shifting heavy boxes to neck a substantial beer. It brought with it a change in how beer was being distributed as well. Rather than being shipped out from day one, it would be aged for a bit in big vats at the brewery, so when it arrived at the pubs and taverns, it was actually in its best condition, and this meant it could now travel for longer and be sent further afield. This switch in distribution changed things in the UK's beer consumption, as the style was so well received it quickly became one of the nation's favourite styles, especially among the working classes. Brewed with brown malts, not pale ones, these dark ales were sometimes known as stout, and sometimes known as porter. Stout in those days simply meant strong, which means that the styles that we know of today had not yet split into two categories. This particular style, of course, would inspire a certain Irishman, but this tale must wait until next time. But beer had got some serious competition in the UK in the early 1700s. As we saw last time, taxes on certain homegrown spirits like gin had been slashed, but increased on beer, making it super popular with those with not too much spare cash. Now don't forget, there were no real regulations back then, and in fact the government were encouraging the production of gin due to us being at war with France for about the billionth time. But they'd also created a bit of a monster. So, about those no regulations, well, this meant that literally anyone could buy gin and beer. And I mean anyone. 
We're talking children here, folks. Like five-year-olds rocking up to a shop and just buying a bottle of gin, as if it was nothing. But this also did bring a brand new drinking dynamic, as all these gin shops that were springing up were not male spaces like taverns and pubs were. And now, women had got a place to go and get their booze from and hang out, just like the guys. As a result, the City of London, where most of England's population resided at the time, rapidly started to become the City of Drunkards, with all the problems that a city of boozed-up citizens would cause. Yep, this was not England's finest hour, I'll admit, and, well, it would take a little while before the government would be able to curb this spike in crime and disorder and drunkenness. But this craze for gin would leave a lasting impression on the taverns and pubs, English drinking culture and beyond. And an intervention that I mentioned in episode 5 of this series would arrive in the next half of the century. The bar. Let's move on to 1709, where a German called Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit invented an alcohol thermometer, which would become very important in brewing. Brewing, of course, involves hot water, and this allowed for consistent temperatures for every part of the process. This year also brought us the modern piano, and the perfection of the coke furnace, which meant that those dark roasted malts that were being used in porter were getting even better than before. Before we head into the 1710s, let's make a quick pit stop to the colonies, where they were still creating homemade beer for the most part, but without the innovations of the old world. As a lot of the colonists were Brit, they were bringing their love of alcoholic apple juice with them, and hard cider was currently being used as a currency in a throwback to thousands of years prior, when the Egyptians had been using beer as payment. Next up are two inventions that might not seem important to beer at all, but would cause impact in the beer industry much, much later. The first was the introduction of the steam engine in around 1712, and this of course was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it would take some time to perfect, but eventually this would pave the way for the world that we all live in today. The other thing to happen that would become important in beer was the merger of some shipping companies who to found the United Company of Merchants of England trading to the East Indies, which is better known as the East India Company, who would of course need to have beer shipped to its workers half a world away from home and that would lead to something interesting. A bit later on, old Fahrenheit would show his face in scientific circles again by inventing the mercury thermometers that we still use today. I've still got one in my cellar. Another thing that we use today is the Fahrenheit temperature scale that he devised. We now had an accurate way of defining temperature. Although, you know, Europe eventually found a new system that it liked better. By the 1720s, things were not looking great for the folks in London mostly because they were still drinking cheap spirits and were completely smashed on a daily basis. Crime had spiked, and more and more families were becoming thrown into poverty due to alcoholism. Unsurprisingly, there was also a health crisis that came with this, a rise in alcohol-related deaths and pregnancy issues. It is no wonder that the colloquial phrase mother's ruin became synonymous with gin. Public sentiment was starting to turn against this trend, and it is no surprise that some religious groups were beginning to chime in on this issue, like the Methodists and the Quakers, who started practicing teetotalism as a response. The government eventually did take notice, and in 1729, 1736 and 1743 started slapping restrictions on the gin trade and general alcohol trade, including the introduction of licensing for shops that sold booze, and these were the beginnings of UK alcohol laws that we've got today. In 1730-ish, a chap called John Clark created a new type of hydrometer, which allowed brewers to see just how alcoholic their brews were, which of course is another step towards a consistent beer, and the shape of beers that we've got today. Plus, as some noted, it was very useful if you wanted to tax a beer on how strong it was. And in terms of beer history, that is about it for the first half of the 1700s. Brewers were starting to figure out how these new inventions could be used to make their beer much better. In the UK, there was still the gin craze to be dealt with, but the 1700s brought with them a new style in the shape of porter, and, like the 1600s, this period heralded the walk before the run that beer was about to take on. In the second half of the 1700s, things started to ramp up pretty quickly, so in part two, a lot of very familiar names are going to start to crop up, so stay tuned for part two, because things are about to get wild. Well, that's all for now, folks. I will see you in the 1750s.